Hello. In this series, we're going to be taking a look at the amazing Nikon Z50. And we're going to be actually looking at photograph. Instead of just talking about and looking at specs, you can get that on Nikon's website. And there's also a lot of photographers that have great reviews on YouTube, so you could find that on there. But we're looking at the actual images. And the images that we're going to be looking at are straight from the camera, no cropping, no level and color adjustment, unless otherwise noted. The lenses and accessories that we're going to be using along with the Z50 would be Nikon ZDX 16 to 50 millimeter lens and also their 50 to 250 millimeter lens. And, of course, keep in mind that the Nikon Z50 is a DX format, so you have a crop factor of 1.5. So that's going to give your field of view, say, in the 16 millimeter lens, it's going to make it 24 millimeter. And if you go up to the telephoto side on a 250 millimeter zoom lens, it's going to give you 375 millimeter. And that's quite a range there. It's going to take you from a beautiful wide angle effect, which is really great for doing street photography, landscapes. And of course, on the other end, you have your 250, which again is going to give you a field of view at 375. That is going to be great for portrait photography. We're also going to be looking at the background blur of the 50 to 250 millimeter lens Although it's not a really fast lens, but if you do things correctly, you can get some really nice background blur out of it, which we're going to have a look at. And we're also going to be looking at the things that I really, really like about this camera. So we're going to start with the top three things why I really like using this camera. So let's take a look at that. High ISO image quality is the number one of the top three things that I like about this camera. It is just amazing. We're going to be looking at a rustic plaque of the North Carolina state flag. And for this, I use the 16 to 50 millimeter lens. And I was set to aperture priority. Camera was on a tripod with the VR turned off. So we start with ISO 100. These are just right out of the camera. Again, no cropping, no correction of any kind. So we're starting with ISO 100. So as we come in close, you can see the clarity of the uh, texture and the wood and the clarity of the hardware on this flag. So let's go ahead up to ISO 800. And coming in closer, you can still see the amazing sharpness and detail of the hardware and the texture in the wood at ISO 800. And then as we move up to ISO 10,000, as we come in close, we can still see even at 10,000, we get some really nice detail in the wood and in the hardware. Of course, you can see it's a little bit degraded now because of the super high ISO, but for a certain type of work like photojournalism or sports, you may need to shoot really high ISOs. And with a camera like this one, it's certainly possible. Here we're looking at ISO 25,600. And again, pretty amazing, but we don't have the exact same detail as we did in a lower ISO's photo but it'll give you an idea what you can achieve at 25,600. Now we're at 51,200. You can see we have some pretty good detail, but everything's starting to get a little bit grainy and pixelated now. And as we go up even more now to the H1 setting, which is 102,400. Pretty, pretty high ISO, and you can see now the uh, grain is starting to appear more, so we're losing some of the clarity, and we can see a lot more grain and pixels now. 
going all the way up to H2, this is 204,800. That is high. And of course, it's not an outstanding quality, but if we had to, uh, certainly it's better than not taking the shot. But I probably wouldn't really use this to uh, anything super important unless it was either get the shot or not or lose it. And also for art's sake or for fun, you can do some enhancements to these super high ISO images. You can turn them into black and whites. You can uh, soften them up just a little bit. You can change the contrast and color using either Adobe Photoshop or any other software program that you want to use. And you can also exaggerate some of the grain if you want to, just to give you more of an artsy look. Next, we're going to look at color and image quality coming right out of the camera. Why is this important? Well, it could save you a lot of time in post-production. So let's have a look. The following images, we use the settings as follows. Contrast, normal. Saturation, normal. Sharpness, hard. Again, aperture priority. White balance. Everything is auto. And in this particular case, the metering was set to spot. And again, these are straight from the camera, no cropping, no color adjustment whatsoever. And in addition to our nice bright colors, we're also getting some pretty amazing sharp image quality. So what about the skin tones? I photographed a few different people with different skin tones to give you an idea. And here's number one. And notice as we come in closer, we can really see the sharpness of the stubbles. And I'm glad he didn't shave for this one so we can appreciate those stubbles and the sharpness. Same thing here. We can really, really see the fine detail in his mustache and the burn of the cigar. Here we're getting some nice natural color in the shade. And again, as we come in very, very close, we can see also that he did not shave that day. And here's the self-portrait that I took. So this is straight from the camera and probably the exposure could have been just a little bit brighter. And I took these remotely using my iPhone to trigger the camera. And the lens used on the last few portraits was the 50 to 250 millimeter. Now, as we zoom in close to this, we can also see the sharpness of my beard here. Now, I got to warn you, don't do this at home because if you zoom in really, really close, it could get very scary. So just a warning. And that brings us to reason number three, why I like the Z50 so much. And it is auto white balance. And, well, what about the images? Well, all the ones that were taken with the Z50, you've been looking at them, taken with auto white balance, no cropping or color adjustment in like levels and so on, with the exception of that one that was marked where the image was retouched, either a little bit of cropping and some retouching and maybe a little bit of enhancing, but all the rest that you saw were auto white balance. So why is this important? Well, it could save you a lot of time in post-production. And is it going to get better as time goes on? More than likely, but uh, right now the Z50. And of course, there's other cameras that are more in the uh, more expensive league that are just as good, if not better. Is the Z50 a perfect camera? By all means, no. But let's put it into perspective. This little camera along with those two kit lenses, for the price point that it is, I think it's a fantastic buy. And uh, also, you're getting great, great image quality out of that little system. There's a lot of photographers that I read about, uh, some photo enthusiasts and, and some pros. If they're going on location and you want to travel light, they'll grab their Z50 instead of their big full frame, and they're very happy using it. Don't believe me? Just check the reviews all over on this particular camera. Very good. And uh, 
like I said, it's not perfect. Uh, the one thing, well, let's talk about a couple things that I didn't like about it too much. I wasn't real happy with the low light focusing. So if you're doing a professional job and you're working in a low light, of course, keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing that I'm really not crazy about, I, uh, I made my living for years and years doing wedding photography. Now I'm retired from wedding photography, but I still do occasional portraits. So some I retired, but I love photography, love portrait photography. But if I was still doing weddings, I would be a little bit afraid of using this camera as my main camera because of the one card slot. Now, I know it's not going to be a big deal to a lot of photographers. It's not really a big deal until something happens. If you heard of Murphy's Law, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's going to be, it's mostly for event photographers, like weddings. Uh, if you're doing like certain events that cannot be duplicated, you can't do them again. So, uh, you never know what's going to happen to that extra memory card. You could lose one or your camera for some reason. They could be corrupted. But to me, now that I'm not a uh, doing wedding photography anymore, I can I'm okay with the one card slot. But I if I have my choice and still doing weddings, I would always go with a camera that has two card slots. I also tried using Snapbridge and doing a self portrait where I was able to trigger the Z50 using my iPhone and I got it going, but it was a little bit tricky in my case anyway. So maybe it was just me, but once I got it going, I thought this was a really cool feature and I can also transfer images from my camera to the phone. Something that's very important to a lot of photographers would be background blur. It could be very important to portrait photography. I know it is for me and maybe sports shooters or photojournalists because what it does is isolate your subject. So your attention goes more to your subject that you're photographing instead of little distracting details that are in the photo. So now I realize, or I don't think there's any substitute for a good prime lens. I love using my 70 to 200 millimeter f 2.8 lens, but if I wouldn't have that, and for portraits anyway, I would definitely be considering the 85 millimeter f 1.4 or even a 1.8 for doing portraits because of its beautiful background blur and bouquet. So I did some comparative testing using the 50 to 250 millimeter lens. And we're going to have a look at how you can get the most background blur from this lens. The lens that I tested it with was the Nikkor 70 to 200 millimeter f 2.8 lens using a Nikon D7200, which is also a DX crop sensor camera. So interesting results. So let's take a look at that. In this portrait session, along with the Nikon Z50, I use the 50 to 250 millimeter lens. So let's take a look at the background blur that we can get using this combination. As you can see, I set the focal length at 250 millimeters. I zoomed all the way in and I set the aperture as far as it would open and that would be f6.3 is the largest aperture and I came in close to the subject here. I probably could have came in a little bit closer but that's the way it is. So how do you get the most background blur when doing a portrait? Well mainly three things. Number one, zoom all the way in. In this case I zoomed all the way to 250 millimeter and of course our field of view is 375 millimeter and because we zoomed all the way in and we also open up our aperture our lens opening as wide as we can and in this case it's f6.3 and we come in as close as we can those are the three things that you can do to get the most blur out of your background now this particular image is full crop. This is how it was out of the camera. However, I did do some enhancing on this. I did some retouching, 
soften the skin tones. And I think I might have adjusted the levels just a little bit. But the cropping is straight from the camera to give you an idea of the background blur. So what I would do, just to finish it up, I would crop in a little bit closer, like you see here. And then I added a vignette, which is a darkening of the sides and the corners, just a little bit, so your attention now is going more to the subject. And we're getting some pretty decent blur in the background here. So I wanted to compare this lens against my 70 to 200 millimeter f2.8 lens. And for that I used the Nikon D7200 and I opened up the lens all the way to f2.8 as the aperture and the focal length I zoomed all the way in to 200 millimeter and again I could have came in a little bit closer. So this particular image if you compare this has a little bit more blur in the background and that's because of the larger aperture. The larger your aperture, you're going to get a smaller depth of field. Therefore, you're going to have more blur in the background. Just to bring that up to some of the new photographers that might not be aware of that. So as we crop in a little bit closer, and again adding just a little bit of a vignette, this is the type of image I would give to my client if this was the image that they would order. I would do enhancement, retouching, and usually a little vignetting along the sides. Now when you look at this particular image as compared to the first one I showed you, the color is a little bit different. It's a little bit duller because we were losing some of that bright light. This was roughly about an hour and a half after the last image that I showed you was taken because this is towards the end of the session where the other one was taken towards the beginning of the session. So that's why we have a little bit of a different color saturation. Let's look at this couple and their dog, also taken with a Z50 and the 50 to 250 millimeter lens. Focal length was 250. F-stop again, all the way open at 6.3. And the ISO is 1600, pretty high. But we do get some decent blur in the background here too. On the next image here, I'm using the Nikon D7200, which is also a DX crop sensor camera. And again, I'm using the 70 to 200 millimeter f2.8 lens now. And again, our focal length was all the way zoomed at 200. And in this case, I set the aperture at f3.5. Sometimes if there's two or more people, well in this case we had two people and a dog, I get a little bit nervous shooting at f2.8. So I used 3.5 and it worked out pretty well. The ISO here was 400. And you can see we get a little bit more background blur using this lens with the larger aperture. And the image that we're looking at now didn't have any cropping done. I'm not sure if I did any color correction. I may have adjusted the levels up and adjusted a little bit more, but this is full cropping from the camera. And if I were to give this to the client, I would crop it just a little bit more because I do want to show the beauty of the outdoors. That's one thing when you do an outdoor portrait. I don't normally like to crop in real close. I like to show some of the environment. And also, if you notice here, well, before and after, I also removed the leaves that were right behind the dog's head. That was a little distracting, so I got rid of that. And this will be my final image to the customer when adding a vignette along the sides. Here's the same couple using the same camera and lens. Pretty nice background blur. And again, this image has no cropping done. I think I did do a little bit of enhancing on the uh, face. And using Nikon's FTZ adapter, I still use the Nikon Z50, but I was able to use the older Nikkor 70 to 200 millimeter f2.8 lens. So using the Z50 along with that lens, our f-stop at 3.2, we get some really nice blur in the background using this combination. 
So it's great that you can use your older lenses with the FTZ adapter. Another lens I used on the Z50 along with the FTZ adapter is the Nikon 28 to 105 millimeter. I use this lens when photographing small products and jewelry for my wife. Plus, it also has macro capability. And just for fun, I put on a Pilang Fisheye 8mm lens, which is a manual focus lens, but it worked out well. Something else that I found interesting was that it shoots at 11 frames per second in full resolution. And you could take it up to 30 frames per second at an 8 megapixel file. And that's pretty impressive. 8 megapixels, I think to, to me that's probably, I'm not a real fast shooter. I mean, I could go, go for 11 frames per second. 30, if you're doing certain things, of course, sports, it's almost necessary. Or maybe some portraits of animals, doggies, and kids, you know, running around doing things. I think that's a, that's a big plus as compared to how it was years ago where you took one shot. <laughs> but anyway, 30 frames per second at 8 megapixel. And I think for most people that's probably more than plenty. Just to give you an idea, I, uh, back in the early days of electronic imaging, I was using the Fuji S2 and S3 and they had a 6 megapixel sensor that they interpolated to 12. And I had a couple of 24 by 36s uh, on my wall in my studio framed, and they were beautiful from a six megapixel camera. So one thing that I found that a lot of people say that you can only get this much out of, out of this certain file size, but I think they under exaggerate because I've I've seen, and you know, myself included, I've made up really large images using smaller megapixels than what they recommend. It also has autofocus tracking, which is a big advantage, I think. And I didn't use that a whole lot. It's especially useful if you're doing animals, dogs. And uh, I used it on a project I was working on where I was doing a video just like this, and I was using the autofocus feature and also set to auto white balance and it came out very very well just as i said it straight from the camera mostly i'm a still shooter but i was working on a project where i had to do some video for a course i was working on and i used the z50 along with a 16 to 50 millimeter lens and i shot the video at high definition and I wanted to see what kind of quality that I can get out of the built-in mic because normally I might use the built-in mic so I could sync up the sound to an external mic that I would use. And I got to tell you that this built-in mic was a lot better than I expected. The video clip was shot on high definition, auto white balance, and I did do just a tiny, tiny bit of cropping. So here's the clip. Hello everybody. Today we're going to be doing something really exciting. Every day is exciting, but this is even a little bit more because we're going to be photographing a small product and maybe a piece of jewelry using just two lights. And the lights that we're using, that's the exciting part. It is these. Two lights from the dollar store. These are L and for fun, time-lapse is an interesting way to record activities and landscape with your Z50. So, as a final wrap-up, I think you're going to find the Z50 a pretty amazing little camera for what it is. Especially along with the two lenses that we talked about, the 16 to 50 and the 50 to 250 millimeter lenses. Now, of course, you can also add to it a good prime and you're going to be set. It uh, has certain advantages over the full frame. Again, like we specified, if you want to go somewhere, travel light and end up with outstanding images, 
Take a look at the Z50, try it out, and see if it's for you. Thank you very much. One last thing. I'm a JPEG shooter, and I'll set my JPEG quality to fine, and the image size I'll normally set to large, unless I'm doing small product and jewelry photography for my wife, and then I'll set it to medium, because I don't need a giant file size just to be used for the web or for eBay. Oh, 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 oh,